Welcome to Listen Here, the audiobook podcast where we bring you chapter listens of our much-loved audiobooks and sometimes special guest appearances, like today. Let's be honest, the Bible can be dense, and we know it. If you're like me, it can be hard to read or understand, and because of that, it can seem daunting to pick up. But now, you can listen to the New Testament being narrated by some of country music's biggest stars. The Country Gospel Audio Bible features 14 country stars reading the NIV New Testament. Find encouragement and faith as you listen to scripture read by some of your favorite performers, including what would be Charlie Daniels' last recording as he reads the Gospel of Mark. You'll start with Rory Feek reading Matthew to nine-time Grammy Award winner Hilary Scott, plus Lauren Elena and Ricky Skaggs, and many more, ending with T.G. Shepard reading Revelation. But enough from me. I'm going to pass it over to producer Gabe Wicks and his interview with David Corlew as they discuss Charlie Daniels and this project, followed by Hilary Scott and what led her to read the Gospel of Luke. This is Gabe Wicks. I'm the uh, the producer on this project, and I'm honored to be spending some time this afternoon with David Corlew. David was Charlie Daniels' right hand for uh, almost five decades, I believe that's correct. It's, it was. Uh, it was uh, 47. We're close to 48 years. I uh, always said I started, I started when I was 23, and uh, I was 70 when he passed. And so uh, I spent my entire adult life with him. Amazing. I've had the pleasure of uh, getting to interview uh, each of the artists that we've had in this project and, and talk a little bit about the, the passage that they read and some reflections on scripture and country music and how they all work together. And obviously we didn't have the, the chance to have Charlie uh, do that on this. So I was just really thrilled, David, that you were willing to, to come in and sit in, in his chair and, and to, to speak on his behalf. And uh, it's appropriate because you had such a big part of uh, bringing this recording about and certainly very appreciative of that. I want to set this up because <laughs> it's just, to me, it's a it's a fun story. So when we first had the idea of doing this uh, this New Testament, the whole notion was who, who could we find that we knew within the country music family who were people of faith? Uh, who would be interested in, in reading an audio Bible. We'd, we'd done one historically, which was uh, Johnny Cash, 40 years ago. And it's one of those that's in our back catalog that people still request because there's just there's a lot of power in hearing someone with a, a voice that's as beloved as Johnny Cash reading the Bible to you. So the idea was, you know, could we, could we kind of replicate that? But this time, could we have, you know, several different artists involved? And the first person that came to mind was Charlie. And I, I remember sitting down with the publisher and saying, all right, so here's who the, the people are I'd like for us to target. And Charlie was still alive at that point. And it was just kind of a given, okay, well, you know, Charlie will call. And we, of course, we had a publishing relationship with Charlie, so that, that made sense. And then between that point and when we actually got into production, you know, without anybody expecting it, Charlie passes. So I remember that day just being doubly upset about the whole situation and thinking, well, Gosh, we, we sure missed out on something he would have enjoyed being a part of. And a couple months later, I'm having lunch with Brian Mitchell, who is uh, Charlie's literary agent, uh, an old friend of mine, and was talking about this with him. And he said, you're not going to believe this, but Charlie recorded an audio Bible on his own. And, and we got to figure out a way to get this recording included uh, in this project. So enter David Corley. You know, that's, that's from my standpoint what happened, but you knew what happened before then. How did, how did this all come about? Well, you know, the, the, the walk with Charlie, uh, both through his career, but then to walk through his, his journey of faith uh, was obviously a gift to all of us. Uh, some of us went scratching and screaming, and, and some of us fell right in, but... Be that as it may, as, as we continued, when Charlie first was transferred down from New York to Nashville, uh, obviously he had, he had become a believer. He had always been a believer, but he became uh, strong in his faith, and he wanted to be a part of everything that he did. So as he had ideas about doing music and things, there were record executives in Nashville that says, oh, it's, 
that won't be good for your career. You have to be Charlie Danielson. Obviously, he was adamant about about his faith. And so we we did some gospel records, We con- and we continued to grow in that part of the business. And as we got closer, uh, one day we were talking, and we had come up with the idea of doing some biblical readings. And then we all we got the old Charlton Heston. We ordered the Charlton Heston, the vinyl versions of that, and started listening to it and said, man, this is something we should do. Because Charlie had gotten to a point in his career where his voice was recognizable and people recognized it. And so we said, that's what we're going to do. And, and then when we realized what an undertaking it would be to try to do the Old Testament and, and do, do the whole the whole deal, we decided to first do the New Testament. So that's how it came about. And, and uh, it was something that he was very nervous about because he was concerned about this pronouncing of the right words, the names, the families. And when, when we're in the chapter of the begots, he wanted to make sure it was right. So we literally hired, I think it was Charlie Jr. that sat in the studio with him with the computer and we literally word by word, when there was a word that stumbled, we'd research it and we would make sure. And and I'm sure Alan Jackson, uh, his pastor from uh, World Outreach, got lots of phone calls. If there was ever anything in question that wasn't right, he called Alan and he wanted to make sure it was clarified and solidified. <laughs> I I got the uh, the files from Chris Warmer. I got to give a shout out to Chris because he certainly was a lot of help in us putting this together. And in talking to Chris, he was the one that told me that, that Charlie actually read from his own personal Bible. This was one that he'd had for a while. It just seemed natural. That was the one he picked you up. Know, I guess. He wanted his Bible. It was a labor-intense project. I mean, he worked hard. I would think that he worked as hard on that as any recorded project that he had ever done because it was something that he had to have right. It had to be right. And then when we finished and, you know, when I got involved in starting to do my job and started looking to get everything cleared, we stumbled on the the mistake that we'd recorded the wrong Bible. Right. <laughs> well, we should probably let people know what we're talking about there. So the, uh, and that's been one of the the challenges, but ultimately a rewarding one to to work through. That the the Bible Charlie had was a 1984 edition of the New International Version, and the project that that we're working on here uh, uses the 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 later translation. Which so there there were some changes, some word choice changes that were made. Nothing. Uh, as far as the the meaning or the intent or you know no, none of the meat was was changed but as the language has evolved of course the the bible translations get updated to go along with that so we had that challenge of well we've got charlie reading this but uh, but some of the words aren't right <laughs> and so uh, that was where it was really just an amazing thing that you know this is this is god working in the whole process because Charlie had also recorded Never Look at the Empty Seats, his, his autobiography. And it happened to have the words read by Charlie in there that we needed to make this recording of the Gospel of Mark that people just got through hearing come together. And, and it's seamless. That's the beautiful thing is, uh, uh, you know, if we didn't tell people right now that that's how that happened, they would never know. What I loved about Charlie was, as is, is he said, sharing his faith was about sharing it with those that struggle with it. You know, he said, I'm the guy that has to put my arm around the shoulder of someone that maybe went out and stayed out a little bit too late on Saturday night or maybe had a few too many drinks or something. And I always wanted them to to know that that they're okay, that they just have to stay in the path, uh, stay headed towards the light and you'll be good. And if you weren't a person of faith, at some point, he'd get around in that conversation. He'd at least tell you he's praying for you. You know, I don't know what the future will hold, and, and maybe there'll be previously unreleased Charlie Daniels music that will come out. But for now, this is his last recording. How do you think he would feel about the appropriateness of his last recording being part of a, an audio Bible? Well, I think that uh, that you know and anybody that knew him and the depth of his, his belief, that uh, I think this would be the most joyful thing that you could give to him 
One of the last interviews he did was with John Rich. And he said that um, he was talking about his farm. And he said, I love this farm. I love this place. He said, I have no intention of doing anything else uh, or living anywhere else. And he said, when I, when I leave this place, I want to go to heaven. And so I think Charlie would be honored. I think it would, it would probably be as much of an honor. Uh, it, would be a, it would be something he'd hold in high regard. He would love it. I think it would be probably as proud of a project that he could have ever been. David, thank you so much for uh, sitting in his, in his place today and for carrying that legacy forward and, and for making sure that we all got a chance to have him on this project. There's nothing that could have made it any better. Once again, that was producer Gabe Wicks talking to David Corlew about Charlie Daniels reading Mark. How about a sneak peek? Here's Charlie Daniels reading Mark chapter 4, The Parable of the Sower. Mark chapter 4. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life The deceitfulness of wealth and desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times what was sown. We're not done yet. Let's hear from Hilary Scott and what led her to choose the Gospel of Luke, plus a sneak peek of her reading Luke chapter 2. Faith Gateway is an online community for readers to discover top Christian books and engage with their favorite Christian authors. They bring together content in many different forms, from daily blog posts to book excerpts, daily devotionals, free downloads, videos, giveaways, contests, free online Bible studies, and more. Faith Gateway is brought to you by HarperCollins Christian Publishing, which publishes works from some of the most beloved and most popular Christian authors in the world today. Faith Gateway provides unique opportunities to connect with those authors and their books as you seek answers to your biggest spiritual questions. Whether you are exploring Christianity or involved in full-time Christian ministry, Faith Gateway has the best resources to meet you where you are today and help you get to the next level in your spiritual journey. Faith Gateway is giving Listen Here listeners 15% off their first order with promo code LISTEN. Visit faithgateway.com to shop the store, sign up for daily devotionals, or join the latest free online Bible study. That's faithgateway.com and promo code LISTEN to receive 15% off your first order. So I wanted to read the book of Luke because 
really a tradition that we started once my husband and I got married, which was reading the story of Jesus' birth from Luke 2 every Christmas. And just this past year, my little girl goes to a Christian school and she had pretty much the entire chapter memorized, the part, the portion about Jesus' birth. And there was not a dry eye in the room on Christmas morning when when my daughter Isley read that, or not read it, she from memory recited it. And when I saw, you know, the books that were available to read, I saw Luke and just felt led to, to pick it. Reading the book of Luke in one sitting is such a deep honor. I mean, and I think as I'm reading through it, again, just how many miracles that Jesus performed and just seeing things jumping out at me more, I think, than they ever have before. It just, it brings it to life in a way that I've never experienced it before. So I'm just so grateful to have the opportunity. It is absolutely, it's going to make me cry. Um, It's so sweet to be a part of something with my mom, and especially the largest part of of our life, which is our faith, and and to be one one family of two families on this project with the Skaggs White family and Ricky and Sharon and Cheryl and Mr. Buck and everybody, we're all good friends, and Ricky you know, produced the faith-based album I did with my mom and my dad and my little sister. So it feels just like an extension of family. And But to think about um, this living on way past my mom, way past me, for my daughters, for our family, um, it's, it's really special. I think one of my most favorite parts about just being a member of the Opry, being a part of that family, and being a part of the family within that Opry family of, of believers. It's just when you're there and you're backstage and you see each other, you have more than just music in common. And having music in common is beautiful and it's special and it's a gift from God. But when you have that other lens, that is really your, your compass that you start from and that you move from and that you live from with being a believer, it just makes interactions and and times together even sweeter. I think my hope for people who might be hearing the book of Luke read for the first time would just be, it, it's, it's honestly more of a question than a statement of just how incredible is Jesus? The way that he still teaches and the way that he loves there's just so much in these words that give us every bit of what we need to know to live in a way that he showed us and i hope that everyone listening can see what a kind and loving and powerful savior he is chapter two the birth of jesus In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom His favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. 
So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Jesus presented in the temple. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. The Boy Jesus at the Temple Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. If you enjoyed this sneak peek, the Country Gospel Audio Bible features all 14 narrators with exclusive interviews and additional content. Be sure to check it out.